Fantastic. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thanks for your patience. I'm Steve DeMello. I'm the Director of Healthcare here at Citrus. And on behalf of Citrus and the School of Public Health, I'd like to welcome you to the special presentation today. Uh, the last two years have been exciting ones for U.S. healthcare, most notably the passage of Comprehensive Health Reform Act. They've also been particularly interesting years for people involved in health information technology. And a large part of that has been the work of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in making information technology a central piece of the reform platform to increase quality, to reduce medical errors, to reduce paperwork, and ultimately to reduce costs. HHS is making unprecedented investments in the deployment and meaningful use of electronic health records, some $20 billion to be spent over the next five years through the American um, Recovery Act. In addition to that, it's also placing large volumes of data into the public domain encouraging entrepreneurs to develop both public and private applications for the use of that data, supporting expansion of technologies such as telemedicine and telehealth, and providing new IT tools and services to the public. We're very happy today to have the man who's at the center of these initiatives and many more, Todd Park, who's the Chief Technology Officer from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. UC Berkeley is a great environment for healthcare IT, the School of Public Health has been doing extensive work in e-health and mobile applications for providers, patients, and community. The School of Information has been doing pioneering work in trying to understand the services science behind delivering on the technology. We at Citrus have been leading through the development of the California Telehealth Network, a groundbreaking platform for both telemedicine and data movement throughout the state. And along with colleagues at the School of Public Health and at the iSchool, we're collaborating on projects that use remote sensing to improve public health and provide more personalized care. We at Citrus and Berkeley in general are committed to making healthcare IT a pivotal part of a transformed U.S. health system. I'd like to now introduce Herb Schultz, who is the Regional Director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Region 9. Herb was recently appointed by President Obama to serve as Secretary Sibelius' chief representative in the region, and he works with a long list of partners on a number of issues related to health and human services, as well as the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Let me give you Herb Schultz. Good afternoon. Um, in large part, I have the easy task, and that's just basically to um, do a couple of thank yous and to introduce my colleague uh, to my right over here in the administration, which is a real pleasure to do. Um, I want to thank, and I think we would like to thank as a department, UC Berkeley for hosting an event that really is designed to bring the federal government to the local level. And that's in large part what the department is doing, what we're doing regionally, and I think what Todd is doing across this country, um, and what I'll be talking about today with healthcare.gov. We all know, and you know far better than uh, probably me at any level, uh, that technology is a very powerful vehicle uh, of, uh, for doing that. And while we know that not everybody has access to the Internet, I think you'll see when Todd walks through healthcare.gov, and you'll also see we have a companion, uh, cuidadodesalud.gov, which has been launched as well, uh, but it does bring the government to the vast majority uh, of people. And I want to thank him for his leadership because it was really a conversation with him on the phone where we were walking through um, the schedule of his events this week, and he said, well, you know, I really want to talk on campus. I really want to get out. I really want to talk with students. I want to talk with faculty. I want to really sort of run through healthcare.gov with people who are really sort of focused and working on this to see, you know, show our vision but what we're doing, what we could be doing better, and things of that. So let me thank Steve Shortell, the Dean of the School of Public Health, who when we met last week, we sort of threw this on top of him because I think I had just gotten off the phone with you, Todd. And uh, he and I want to thank uh, Linda as well, Newhauser, uh, Professor Newhauser, who were sort of there. Gil Ojeda was there and just said, okay, run with it. And I just said, well, we'll call Michelle Moskovitz and Steve Shortell. You all go tell the students. So we are webcasting today, and we thank you for being here. 
Um, I also want to thank Michelle Moskovitz. Where is Michelle? There she is, the Director of Government Relations. Uh, those of you that don't know her should get to know her because she's a dynamo. I used to serve as Governor Schwarzenegger's senior advisor and Governor Davis's Labor Secretary, and I've worked with Michelle for a very, very long time, and she's a great asset. Um, so what I'd like to do now is the easy job is introducing my colleague Todd Park who joined HHS, uh, was appointed by the President in August 89 as the Chief Technology Officer of the Department. And in this role, he's responsible for helping HHS harness the power of data, harness the power of data, technology, and innovation to improve health and the welfare of our nation. He co-founded Athena Health in 1997 and led its co-development over the following decade into one of the most innovative, socially oriented, technology-based, information-based companies in the industry. Uh, prior to that, he was at Booz Allen Hamilton. Maybe we should talk about some of those consulting days a little bit later. Uh, but he was focusing on healthcare strategy, technology, uh, and operations. He also served in a voluntary capacity for the Center for American Progress, and he focused on health IT and health reform there, and a senior health policy advisor to Ashoka, a leading global incubator of social entrepreneurs. Um, he uh, has done some venture work bringing affordable telehealth, drugs, diagnostics, and clean water to rural India. And we just had a conversation before about the California Telehealth Network, and I think your background meshes very, very well with that. I was fortunate to work with the school when I was with Governor Schwarzenegger, and gr glad to see it off the ground and, and here at Citrus. So um, Todd graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from a very little known East Coast school in um, Oh, where is it? Massachusetts, Harvard College. And it's been a real delight over the last day and evening to start to get to know Todd well. Uh, and he does have a place here, so we do consider him another addition of California uh, to uh, the Department of Health and Human Service. Actually, he was there before me. So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce you all to my colleague, Todd Park. Thank you, Herb. Hello. How's everybody doing? Fantastic. Now, so uh, raise your hand if you are a student or faculty member at the Berkeley School of Public Health. Okay. If you are not, where are you from? Just, just shout it out. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Wonderful. Agriculture. Super cool. Excellent. Very cool. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Well, this room. Oh, yes, you. Fantastic. Well, I'm thrilled, actually, about that, because the group of people in this room, at the intersection of public health, engineering, business, agriculture, yes, agriculture, design, uh, and policy, is exactly the combination of people that is required to come together to improve health in this country. And actually, I'm going to call an audible. I'm going to actually both talk about healthcare.gov, but also talk about another initiative, which I'm actually dying to get you involved in, uh, called the Community Health Data Initiative, which actually does represent a growing number of people who are actually from those disciplines integrating into a single ecosystem uh, trying to improve health in this country. So actually, let's bookmark that as well and talk about that in a second. How much time do we have total? Okay. Okay, so we'll keep, it to, we'll keep it to half an hour. So I'll spend, like, basically maybe 10 minutes on healthcare.gov, maybe 10 minutes on community health data initiative, and have 10 minutes for Q&A. And I'll stay as long as you want. Derek Van Brunt! Hello, brother. How are you? <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. And we'll talk about Derek when we talk about community health data initiative uh, in a second. So healthcare.gov is the first thing that I'll chat with you all about. Have, have, have uh, you all visited healthcare.gov? Anybody visited? Okay. Well, I'll assume that you have it, and I'll basically kind of talk about it as if you hadn't seen it at all. It's actually uh, a site that we unveiled initially on July 1st. Uh, it's a new website that was actually required by the Affordable Care Act that helps consumers uh, take control of their own health care, helps them actually search for coverage options, uh, both public and private, and helps them make the right choices by playing the power of information at their fingertips. It's actually the first website uh, that integrates a comprehensive inventory of both public and private coverage options in a single website and doesn't dump all that information on your head like a giant encyclopedia, but through an elegant insurance options finder asks you a series of questions that then generates uh, from three billion different scenarios a customized menu of public and private choices uh, that may be right for you. So public programs are like Medicaid, uh, the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, the new pre-existing condition insurance plans, and then private programs are, of course, 
private uh, insurance plans across the country. It's already been used by over 2 million Americans uh, to learn more about their insurance options and try to find the right coverage for them and their families. Uh, it also actually helps you understand uh, how to navigate the insurance marketplace in general, how the Affordable Care Act is morphing that marketplace uh, to create value and benefits for the public, uh, like the new Patients' Bill of Rights. Uh, also, actually, as you'll see in a second, uh, has the beginning of sections that help you choose a high-quality care provider and help you stay healthy through prevention tips, um, which we'll see in, in just a moment. Uh, on October 1st, actually, uh, just last Friday, I'm a little sleep deprived still because <laughs> it's just a hangover from working like crazy uh, for the last several weeks um, on the new edition of healthcare.gov, we added pricing information uh, for private insurance plans. Over 4,400 private insurance plans across the country offered by over 225 insurance carriers. Uh, so what happens is, as you'll see, is you'll enter uh, essentially a, a date of birth, gender, smoking status, family size, zip code, and it'll actually generate a price estimate for those factors. Uh, it'll actually give you a whole bunch of detail about uh, benefits like uh, uh, deductible, maximum out-of-pocket limit, what's covered, cost strength for what's covered. And actually, very, very importantly, it also includes two new metrics which have never before been publicly available in any form, which is the percentage of the time that you actually want to get that product and are denied, and the percentage of the time that actually you get charged more than the standard rate based on your age, gender, smoking status, zip code, and family size. So these numbers are, as you'll see, incredibly interesting uh, and provide a lot of transparency and insight uh, into what the heck is actually going on uh, and makes it even more possible for consumers to really compare plans head to head uh, and make the choices that are right for them. Uh, we also actually, uh, for, those, for those of you who are fans of Medicaid and CHIP, like me, uh, we've also debuted enhanced uh, Medicaid chip information around cost sharing for chip services, uh, chip and Medicaid plans in U.S. territories and other uh, really exciting stuff. And the whole point of all this, the whole point of healthcare.gov is not just to put a pretty website up, right? It's actually put consumers in charge in a marketplace where they definitely have not been charged, have not been in charge historically. Um, the point is to actually produce a one-stop resource that actually enables consumers to see their choices, compare their choices head-to-head, -head, and make the decisions that are right for them. Uh, make the market more open and more transparent than it's ever been before because a more transparent marketplace where consumers can see their choices and compare them is a marketplace that by definition will be more competitive and a more competitive marketplace is one that will produce lower cost and better value for consumers. So that's the whole point of healthcare.gov, not just to put up a website, uh, but to really help shape the market and make it more consumer friendly, put the consumer in charge, engender more transparency, competition, and value for consumers. So let's actually just take a quick run through healthcare.gov um, so, and I'll also say that actually uh, on September 8th, we also launched a uh, companion site, Cuidado de Salud.gov, which is the Spanish translation of the entire site. Um, and uh, what you do um, is uh, you, uh, uh, in terms of the marquee attraction, uh, is you go to the insurance options finder. Um, and actually now I'll just start over because someone looks like uh, they use this already here. So what happens is uh, you go to the insurance options finder, you find, um, you know, what state, you live in, I'll pick uh, California. And let's say uh, I'm a healthy individual. You can pick any number of different choices to describe your life situation. Then you hit next. Uh, and then you just answer a few more questions. Let's say I need health insurance. Let's say I'm 25 years old. Uh, let's see, none of these apply to me, just for the sake of this scenario. Do I find it difficult to afford insurance? Yes. And then you hit submit, and then it pulls up uh, very rapidly, as you can see, six options uh, that are specific to you that uh, we think could be cool for you. Um, so one is that actually under the Affordable Care Act, starting in September, uh, and for a lot of plans even earlier, uh, you now actually have, until you're 26, the ability to get coverage under your parents' plan, which is actually a very important thing to know. Uh, you can also actually uh, look at uh, Medicaid, uh, pre-existing condition insurance plan, which is a new plan that was set up in July across the country for people with pre-existing conditions that can't get coverage uh, from uh, conventional health insurance. Let me actually just show you this section because this is the site that actually, part of the site that got turbocharged October 1st. This is the private insurance plan marketplace on healthcare.gov. So uh, what you do is uh, at this point you can ask just a few more questions. So let's say I'm, I'm living in Los Angeles and I want my coverage to start 11-1-2010. And let's say uh, I'm a young woman uh, who was born uh, on the summer solstice of 1985, and I'm not a smoker, 
Um, one important note here, actually, which we go out of our way to say, is that this information is actually a little sensitive. So one very important thing for folks to know is that the government's not keeping any of this information. Uh, it's only being entered uh, at, so that healthcare.gov can generate a list of options for you. But then actually when you leave the site, it gets deleted and we don't keep it. So then you hit submit. Um, and then you're actually shown a series of messages that we want to make sure you understand before you see your options, that we're not recommending specific plans. We're just organizing and presenting information collected from insurers that the actual premiums you're quoted may be higher than what you see here based on your health status because, as we'll explain further, in a lot of states, you go through a process called medical underwriting uh, where, based on your health status, you can be charged more than the base rate. And until the Affordable Care Act is fully implemented, you may still be denied coverage based on your health status. Then you hit Show Me the Plans, and it pulls up, in this case, 50 private insurance plans available uh, to me in zip code 90016. Um, you can see basically each plan listed here in the form of an index card, uh, and it actually has uh, key information uh, that we actually derived from a bunch of uh, historical and current consumer research about what's important for consumers to understand. Maximum out-of-pocket cost. Uh, if you don't know what that is, you can actually uh, you know, click on each blue uh, phrase, and it actually tells you in English uh, exactly what the hell that means. Uh, you know, uh, annual deductible, uh, doctor choice, prescription coverage, um, and then, a very interesting column, <laughs> monthly premium estimate. Premiums start at $245 per month for a young woman, age 25, born on the summer solstice, who doesn't smoke in Los Angeles, California. Um, but you may be charged more, which is very, very important, which a lot of people don't know. Um, uh, and so you can actually click on that to learn more about what that means. And you basically learn that, look, insurers actually, uh, for the time being, can charge more than this estimate uh, based on your health status. Uh, this can make your costs much higher. Uh, but under the Affordable Care Act starting in 2014, uh, insurers won't be allowed to do that anymore. Um, and so in this case, you can see that 10% uh, of applicants received surcharge quotes, higher quotes. And 38% of people were turned down. And again, you can click on this to learn more about what that means. That you know, basically, insurers don't have to sell policies to everybody in the current marketplace. They may or may not decide to sell you one based on your health condition, medical history, even your job. Uh, but under the Affordable Care Act, as of September 2010, uh, insurers can't turn children down because of health status. And starting in 2014, they can't do that for anybody. But for the time being, that's something you have to actually understand uh, as you are walking through the insurance marketplace. Um, so let's actually just go through uh, a case scenario where I say, okay, look, I'd like to actually sort these uh, from low to high monthly premium estimate. So interestingly, which this crowd may be especially interested in, we actually did the default sort, default order in which these plans appeared by maximum out-of-pocket cost, low to high, the maximum out-of-pocket liability that you have in any given year. We did that based on uh, advice from people like Mike Robluski, who is ex-Consumer Reports Ninja Prince of how to present the insurance information to consumers. Because uh, it turns out, based on his and other people's research, Jonathan Gruber, Rajul Patel, that consumers in the insurance marketplace disproportionately uh, basically focus on monthly premium estimate. And they don't actually pay enough attention to the protection offered by what you're buying, right? Uh, of which monthly, uh, of which annual maximum out of pocket cost is actually really important. So we kind of went out of our way to try to correct for people's tendency to focus on this by making sure they also focused on maximum out of pocket cost, among other things. But let's say you, know, you decide to essentially reorder this uh, by monthly premium estimate low to high. I can resort and uh, figure that out. And I can see that, oh, there's something called you know, deductible 55,000 you know, NM, Kaiser Permanente. I can click on plan details. Uh, and this is actually a framework that we derived uh, from work of people like Mike Robluski, uh, Karen Pollitz, and others, which basically tells you on the left-hand side uh, you know, what dimension to focus on, and on the right-hand side, what the value is of those dimensions. Um, I think the coolest part of this is something we call coverage scenarios, um, which in the Robuski testing, you know, just scored bonkers wonderful um, as a way for people to absorb information. It's to say, look, here are common medical events. Like, what if I'm sick and go to the doctor's office? Or what if I have an emergency? Here are the services you might need in that situation. Here's your cost sharing uh, in, those given, uh, in those given scenarios, which is a wonderful way, actually, to really kind of make this really come alive uh, for folks. Um, and uh, you can actually see that uh, if I look at this, uh, I might say, oh, well, if I become pregnant, not covered. That's not good. So this is actually a really cheap plan, but, you know, it's not like I was planning to have a baby, but I don't want to preclude the possibility of having a baby, and so maybe the cheapest plan isn't right for me. 
right? So what I could do at that point is go back and say, let me bookmark this, add it to my comparison cart up here for me to compare head-to-head -head other plans. But let me think about maybe some other plans to check out. And so here in this uh, column, I can actually do a faceted search. I can do a, a filtered search for plans that are within a given range on maximum out-of-pocket cost or annual deductible. And I can say to myself, okay, look, if I take a close look at my personal budget, you know, I think you could probably afford premiums of between $200 to $300. Maybe that will give me some better coverage than this uh, really, really cheap plan. So I hit this, and it refilters the plan list to only show me the 14 plans that are between $200 to $300 per month in terms of monthly premium. What I can then do is then click Compare, and let me pick one more, Active Start, or maybe, uh, maybe this one, and then uh, and hit Click to Compare. And this is actually my favorite page in the whole website, <laughs> which is in one place I can compare head-to-head -head three plans against each other, against the same dimensions uh, that I can see each individual plan's information uh, on, and I can look at you know, premium varying, I can look at some very interesting variation, what percentage of the time I get charged more or get denied if I apply. I can look at deductibles being very different. So this super cheap plan uh, has a very high deductible, and these more expensive plans actually have lower deductibles, which actually makes sense and generally tends to be true, um, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. So, uh, but the whole point, again, is, is to take a marketplace uh, that's historically been really opaque and really hard to navigate and just make it you know, as easy as, 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 you know, almost as easy, I should say, as looking for an airline ticket or anything else online, right, uh, by being able to compare your choices head to head. And it's the case, you know, it, it, it's, it's the law of the market that <laughs> if consumers know what their choices are and can compare them in an informed way, that will breed more competition. That will breed a market that is more responsible than consumers want, and that will lead to better results and better value for consumers. And so we're uh, super excited um, about this. Uh, and just to actually show you a couple other things on healthcare.gov, uh, there uh, is actually uh, a set of special sections on folks in different life situations, uh, families with children, seniors, et cetera, and there's information um, about how the Affordable Care Act will benefit you, about how to navigate the insurance marketplace, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's a section on learn about prevention, uh, which actually uh, has an embedded tool called Health Finder, where you can actually answer a few questions and get tips about how to stay healthy. Uh, derived from the collective uh, knowledge base of uh, HHS. Uh, there's a section called the Compare Care Quality, which embeds a set of tools, uh, hospital compare, nursing home compare, dialysis facility compare, that enable you to search for uh, the highest quality and best uh, hospitals and nursing homes. And the whole point is for healthcare.gov, again, to be a one-stop resource uh, for you, your family, your small business, uh, to give you the information that you need to get the right coverage, to stay healthy, to get the right provider. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the Affordable Care Act, there are about 20 pages worth of provisions, if you compile them all together, uh, provisions which say publish data for people on the Internet. <laughs> and what we don't want to do is publish like 80,000 different websites where that happens. We want to actually make it all happen through healthcare.gov and really, as, as you can hopefully see, render it in the form of not a government website, as you've come to expect it, but as a true consumer tool, uh, a consumer service that actually does useful things for consumers in ways uh, that they find helpful um, and that that consumers can actually understand. Um, so that's healthcare.gov in a nutshell. Um, are there questions about that that I can answer off the top of your head? Okay, uh, uh, starting with you, yes. Um, is it accessible? What a fantastic question, not yet, but we are very excited about doing this. Um, and uh, actually the thing I'm even more excited about, this is actually kind of you know, not a concrete plan yet, you know, but something we're thinking about. Um, I'm excited about not just building a mobile app version of the insurance options finder, but actually exposing the finder via an API. Um, and uh, the, the, I actually think that, you know, it, it just happens to be the case that the mobile app would be the first app to use the API. Uh, but I think that the even greater social good than the mobile app would be the API itself. Because that would then enable essentially other applications and websites to auto query <laughs> uh, uh, and utilize the functionality of healthcare.gov, right, you know, in really powerful ways. And so. Um, but another reason I'm excited about the mobile app is one of our big concerns is digital divide, right? Um, and one of the things that uh, health professionals have said to me, which is very exciting, is that they want to put healthcare.gov on their smartphone, right? And so when they make the rounds, you know, uh, in their clinics or at the hospital, et cetera, they can actually use it um, as a tool uh, to help folks actually in, in sticky insurance situations, which more and more people are in these days. Yes, ma'am.
It's a fantastic question. Um, so uh, what we actually did was, oh yes, the question was how did we actually uh, get insurers to give us um, incredibly sensitive information um, like uh, the percentage of the time that they deny people, right, by product. So what we actually said was is in order to be displayed on healthcare.gov at all, you have to give us all the data we're asking for, including the percentage denied and including the percentage upcharged. And if you didn't, and also if you didn't have your CEO or CFO attest to the validity of the information you submitted, we're not going to put your data on healthcare.gov. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm very happy to say that we've gotten enormous engagement from insurers on this process. They really do uh, want to get their data in the marketplace <laughs> next to their competitors. Uh, and so there are insurers and products that didn't make it for October 1, but it wasn't generally because he decided to just, you know, not play. That was because he actually genuinely couldn't make the deadlines, you know, uh, all the deadlines we set out. Um, so the inventory in healthcare.gov is going to be updated every month starting in November. Um, and I can already tell you that in just a few short weeks there will be even more plans at healthcare.gov and more after that, and all the data will be continually updated. So it's actually very, been very exciting. Yes, ma'am. We, we don't have a firm beat on that yet. Uh, you know, we, we, we know that there are over 4,400 plans, over 225 carriers, all 50 states in D.C. Um, the majority of the people who actually attempted submission and the majority of the plans that attempted submission actually made it. Um, and so we know that there's a chunk that didn't make it that are, by definition, people who are, I think, in the market. <laughs> but but what, what actually kind of added to the, the fluidity of the underlying situation is that Another thing happened around October 1st, which was on September 23rd, right, the Patient's Bill of Rights went into effect, right, and insurers can no longer do a set of things, and patients are now guaranteed the right to do certain things. So every insurer in America had to refactor all of their plans to adapt them to those new criteria, and they had to get them actually approved by the State, Department, State Departments of Insurance. And so we know that actually in a number of states, um, there were actually uh, carriers who want to be on healthcare.gov, could have submitted the data, but didn't because their state departments hadn't approved their plans yet by the submission deadline. And our requirement was that if you're going to list on healthcare.gov, it has to be a plan that is open for enrollment. And if it hasn't been approved by the State Department of Insurance, then it's not open for enrollment. So, um, so you know, once, I think come November, we'll have actually a better sense of what the landscape is post-September 23rd and a better sense of kind of what percentage of the universe we actually have. Uh, but it's, of course, our goal to get everything <laughs> on healthcare.gov. Yeah. Excuse me. Can, I just want to ask if you could use the microphone so we can let the listeners outside the room. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, oh, my pleasure. Are there plans to uh, launch uh, tools for um, more advanced analytics of some of the data points that you've had? So this primarily functions as a consumer tool, but, right. you know, aggregating the percentage of uh, upcharge, for example, to look at distributions, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I can publicly say, because uh, it's stated in uh, one of our regulations, is that um, it is our intent to take the raw underlying data uh, inside healthcare.gov uh, and make as much of it available as a downloadable public use file for free as possible uh, within the constraints of the law. So basically we have to figure out, you know, what is a trade secret once proprietary um, because it's illegal to release that. But everything else we want to release. So we'll be going through a process to do that, but that's very much our intent. And that's part of the broader uh, Obama administration open government agenda, which is basically take every data set we possibly can <laughs> um, that doesn't violate privacy, doesn't violate you know, some other um, constraint um, or um, you know, valid restriction and make it available as a free downloadable data file um, uh, to, to benefit the, the public. Which actually is a good segue, uh, if, if it's okay, uh, to talk about the Community Health Data Initiative, if I, if I might. So um, I'm going to do this in like 17 seconds. <laughs> so the Obama administration is actually affecting right now one of the most profound changes in the nature of government in American history. And something that actually hasn't been covered by the media at all. Uh, and it's called the Open Government Initiative. Uh, like the, the fourth thing that the president did after he was sworn into office was sign an order that basically uh, directed the federal government to become more transparent, participatory and collaborative. Uh, so transparency is all about publishing government data to help the public hold the government accountable and to help generate public benefit. Uh, participatory is to basically get citizens from all walks of life engaged in the work of government. 
uh, in recognizance of the fact that, as the president said, expertise in society is increasingly dispersed. And collaborative is getting the government to work better with itself, <laughs> better with the private sector, better with the world outside government to take on the great social challenges of our day. Um, so HHS has been enthusiastically executing against this open government directive. If you go to hhs.gov slash open, you can download a copy of our open government plan, which is a 100-page document that has a very ambitious agenda in terms of advancing uh, data publication, transparency, participation, and collaboration in HHS. But one particular initiative I want to talk about that Derek's been working with us on is something we call the Community Health Data Initiative. And in a nutshell, it's HHS basically copying the weather. And what I mean by that is uh, how many of you are familiar with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration? Okay, so those of you who know NOAA know that NOAA supplies virtually all weather data in America, right? So it's not like the Weather Channel has its own hurricane sensor network or the night newscaster has, you know, her own barometric pressure readers, right? I mean, they get all that data from NOAA. Uh, NOAA basically collects all this data and publishes it in XML format in uh, a way that's really accessible, easy to get, 100% uh, free, and provided without intellectual property constraint. And then that data is soil that gets turned into crops, a social benefit uh, by the Weather Channel, weather.com, iPhone weather app developers, et cetera, who use the data to power applications and services and products that generate benefit for the public. So it's a wonderful example of a public private sector ecosystem that's generated extraordinary value for the country. So the idea behind the Community Health Data Initiative is to make HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, into the NOAA of health data. It's to take the extraordinary amount of data that we have uh, about public health performance, healthcare costs, quality, utilization, determinants of health, and make that available uh, for free to the public in a way that's easy to find, uh, downloadable via web services wherever possible, uh, uh, at no charge and without intellectual property constraint. Uh, and we just got this going earlier this year uh, and put out an initial supply of data and had innovators uh, like Derek, <laughs> uh, who've been working at this for years, actually, in a lot of cases, uh, and others who just arrived uh, and started working on this, Ha turn that data into an extraordinary profusion of super cool applications that the government never could have come up with by itself. Um, and actually, if you have some time, um, I would actually recommend uh, uh, going on YouTube and uh, searching for Community Health Data Initiative, and you'll see uh, a session hosted by the Secretary, Secretary Sebelius, uh, and me, and uh, CTO of the U.S., Anish Chopra, and others, uh, that showcased Derek and other cool applications uh, that use community health data to deliver extraordinary benefit to people, uh, consumers, patients, employers, providers, mayors, et cetera. Uh, and what we're basically doing in a nutshell is we're now committing to publish even more data in ever more accessible forms uh, for the public. Uh, so for example, uh, in December, we're gonna be releasing an Uber site. We'll release an Uber site called health.data.gov, which will be a site which will basically list every single data set available from the entire federal government that relates remotely to health, not just from HHS, but also from USDA, uh, from HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development, from the Environmental Protection Agency, et cetera. Uh, data sets and tools uh, that give you access to data uh, that relates to health. We'll have an application showcase where we'll highlight Derek and other folks who actually have built amazingly cool applications using our data that should be inspirational and are in and of themselves useful to know about. We'll have a, a whole uh, online community where people will actually open up discussions about data sets, point out flaws in the data, ask for improvements in the data, ask for new data sets, talk about what they're doing. And actually another section where we'll actually list connections to other websites, private sector websites, non-governmental websites that have complementary data that can be made available to the ecosystem. Um, and on top of that, um, th there's other tools we'll be releasing, but kind of in a nutshell, the federal government's putting out just an enormous amount of data that could be incredibly powerful uh, uh, in terms of informing decision making by everyone from individuals to governments about health. But another place I'd encourage you to check out, um, another facet of this community health data initiative is a website called um, uh, Health, I cut my finger here so I'm having trouble typing, health2challenge.org. So this is actually um, a site uh, that ha we've been working on uh, with an organization called Health2.0, which is a conference organizer and kind of innovation networker in the healthcare space. And it's a site where anyone can challenge the world to build applications that meet a particular objective. Um, so HHS has launched a challenge on the site uh, for the best applications to take our hospital compare data and make it really useful through mobile apps and web apps for consumers. Um, uh, uh, Yville, uh, which is a really cool nonprofit that works on educational software, has launched a public challenge for the best applications that engage kids in health data and help them actually change their behavior. Uh, there's a company called um, Catch, 
that's launched a challenge for the best applications to help encourage physical activity. Uh, there are over 12 challenges, I think, uh, uh, 12 and soon to be more challenges currently listed on the site. And they're basically public competitions issued by governments and organizations and foundations and companies to the world. Anyone can actually scrub in to compete. Um, and uh, there are cash prizes for the winners. Um, and actually a lot of, uh, a lot of renown, a lot of, uh, a lot of celebration. So at the Health 2.0 conference that's happening in front of a thousand of the most uh, innovative people in healthcare uh, later this week, Anish Chopra, the CTO of the United States and me, are going to hand out the prizes for the, the winners of the first six challenges. Um, and this is a site that will keep going. More challenges will be added to it. Uh, but we'll be incredibly excited uh, to have folks in this room scrub in on the site, uh, take a look at the challenges, and see if you actually want to compete. Um, it's in San Francisco. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, of course it's in San Francisco. <laughs> it's an innovation conference. <laughs> it's by definition. Not in D.C. It's in San Francisco. Um, it is uh, Thursday and Friday. This week. Health 2.0. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh but, but, but not all the challenges will be, you know, like concluded, uh, you know, this week. Uh, you know, the, the challenges actually um, are, uh, uh, it's, it's an evergreen challenge site. You know, there are challenges on the site currently with lots of different windows. So, you know, even if there's a challenge that ends this week, there are more challenges uh, that will keep going. Uh, like, for example, the HHS challenge uh, around compare data is one that I think uh, terminates, uh, I want to say, November. Uh, mid-November, so there's more time to compete there. And we're going to be offering additional challenges, and others will be offering additional challenges um, as the site, you know, continues. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the conference? I actually am not sure. <laughs> I should ask somebody, because I'm supposed to give a speech there. Uh, but um, somewhere in San Francisco, I think it's unfortunately sold out, is the problem. Uh, and so the, the conference is at capacity. Uh, you know, but uh, th there'll be, you know, more conferences and, you know, more kind of gatherings like that. Um, and again, this challenge website will continue living on and on and on. But the whole point, again, is to, is to try to get folks uh, you know, to, 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 to get involved, to try to take data and leverage its power uh, in the form of applications that help consumers and patients and doctors and nurses and community health workers and employers and governments make better decisions. Um, and that's something that, that, that HHS does not have as a core competency. <laughs> HHS is not renowned as an application development organization, right? What, what our proper role is, is to basically take the data that we've already collected on behalf of the public, make it available, right, and then market the bejesus out of it, right, and get people interested in it, and then actually have other people, right, who are much faster, much smarter, uh, you know, much more innovative, uh, you know, uh, than uh, HHS is, you know, or could possibly be, right, you know, to turn it into uh, incredibly cool apps that benefit the public. And one of the things that someone said to me once, it's very, very wise, uh, in which I think the Community Health Data Initiative is living proof of, is that no matter who you are, right, you have to remember that most of the smart people in the world don't work for you, right? And that actually the way to be successful is to get them to care about what you care about, to enable them to succeed, um, and have the world get better as a result. And that's really the whole point of the Community Health Data Initiative, is have the government play this very small role, which is to take the data and make it public, and then basically market it and catalyze and celebrate the innovations happening with it, but really have the rest of the world <laughs> do the innovation. Um, and that's actually you know, been shown as a wonderful play by NOAA. You know, similar plays have happened with GPS data and financial data. We're just trying to make it happen with health data. So we'd love to get all of you involved in the Community Health Data Initiative. Uh, you know, check out the YouTube video. Uh, go to health2challenge.org. Actually, and also on health2challenge.org, you can see examples of other apps uh, like Network of Care for Healthy Communities that Derek's built that people have done already. Uh, but you know, scrub in. Build something awesome, and we'd love to celebrate it and promulgate it and make something that becomes part of the healthcare landscape. Because a lot of people are paying attention to the outputs of this set of competitions right now. So I think that's half an hour. Um, I, can, I can stay to answer questions, though, if folks want to. Yes, sir. Policy question. Yes. California, or the governor signed last week the health insurance exchange. So it'll be a very interesting time over the next 12 to 24 months in getting this up and running. Yes. How will healthcare.gov impact that and facilitate the creation of the health exchange TBD. in California? TBD. Um, so uh, we're actually working on how healthcare.gov as a portal and the exchanges themselves will actually intertwine. Uh, we know that they will. Uh, we're working out the details of how exactly that will work. 
Um, uh, but that, that's an excellent question, one that we're, uh, we're working on as we speak. So, yes, sir. Um, I have a, since I have so many public policy, I mean public health people here, I have something to contribute to you. Um, I do search, and years ago we noticed there, was a, there wasn't any neighborhood boundary data. Uh -huh. And so we acquired basically the country and we're doing the world. I teach engineering, but I'm very active in search. We noticed that localized search, especially neighborhoods, have a consistency that you don't have in census tracts or in zip codes, which are arbitrary units for delivering mail. Yeah. And we'll make this freely available to Wow. You. I've been working on this, with leading projects like this all over the, actually all over the world for awesome. many years, and this is my contribution to public health. To tell you the truth, when we first started doing it, we did it mostly for search and for um, real estate and other things, and all these people from public health said, hey, how do we get this stuff? And then EPA and HUD wants to use it for foreclosure analysis. So cool. My, my email is easy to remember, and you send me an email, I teach here, it's berkeley at gmail.com. Berkeley at gmail.com? Yeah, You're I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so I well, what, I'd love to connect with you because actually on, on healthdata.gov, you know, remember that other website section? Like, you know, I'd love to publicize you well, as a... Show you, I mean, to integrate, yeah. Yeah. If you're addressing disease yeah. 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 Well, absolutely. And, and, and you know, what, one of the things that uh, would be just profoundly awesome uh, is... Um, is to, is to get you engaged in conversations with the folks that are producing data at HHS, because they can actually leverage what you've done to potentially produce the data in different, in different forms now, well, right? That, really I mean, that would be great. Of course, we're focusing on neighborhoods, but there are other yeah. demographic units, too. That are yeah, awesome, fantastic. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Saul Rosenberg. I'm a psychologist Hello. at UCSF. The psychologist is going to be the key to my question. Um, I've been working in this field for about four years, mm -hmm. and I wonder how I could enlist your aid or whether you could tell me where to go yeah. to address what I think is the biggest single gap in the whole health IT landscape, yeah. which is mental health. Mm -hmm. Everyone gives lip service to it. There's actually no infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There is no health IT infrastructure for mental health. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's no psychological informatics. Mm -hmm. Biomedical informatics doesn't cover psychology. Mm -hmm. There's no agreed upon terminologies. Mm -hmm. There are no clinical decision support systems. Mm -hmm. There's no agreed upon um, uh, privacy and confidentiality confidential standards when you're dealing with mental health and substance abuse data. Yeah. So each state's got its own rules, yeah. very much in need of federal lead leadership on that. But the problem is the data in. You, there is no way to judge the, um, the quality of psychiatric care right now. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no standardization. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see from the government is more um, RFIs and RFPs mm -hmm. and challenges specifically in, not, in mental health. Interesting, and, okay. And behavioral and psychological yep. health. Yep. When you look at all the stuff that's come out, you, you'll see maybe one bullet point out of 10 has to do with behavioral health. Yeah. And then it's completely ignored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a fantastic point. Um, the right guy to talk to is probably a guy named Chuck Friedman um, at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Um, he's the uh, chief science officer there, um, and I think he'd be extraordinarily interested um, in that question. Um, and I can give you his email address after this. Great. Yeah. Yes, sir. So as we are moving more toward interactive from the web, we are moving into the more interactive and video base. Uh, is any initiative or ideas on offering video based like IPTV type of services mm -hmm. for, for example, doctors mm -hmm. or physicians that could see the patients remotely and providing their uh, advice and yeah. things of this nature. There, there, there's a huge amount of innovation happening uh, along those lines right now, uh, which we can chat more about offline. You know? um, I mean, mostly happening you know, in the private sector, honestly. <laughs> Um, and in the research sector, uh, but, but uh, it's, it's actually an intense interest of mine uh, because um, for a lot of different reasons, but it has the opportunity uh, to help address a bunch of disparities in terms of access to care, uh, that disparities among a variety of different dimensions if we actually can make that happen and make that easier. Um, so there's a whole bunch of really cool work happening there right now, and we can talk more about that uh, maybe after this. Yeah. We just have and time last question. question. Okay. Oh um, thanks again for your talk. Oh, thank you. And um, I have kind of a double question. Does okay. that count? 
It's fine. Um, I'm curious about the testing of healthcare.gov on, say, average people yeah. who are often left out by reason of the literacy divide yeah. and other divides yeah. and how that uh, happened and what the plan is in the future. The second part of this is if this is one-stop shopping mm -hmm. and so nicely done, as we see, does this mean that states perhaps would not have to recreate this information but could um, have folks go to healthcare.gov? You know, the question of healthcare exchanges mm -hmm. in states would be a complicating factor. Um, so to answer uh, your, your first question, uh, we have been engaged in uh, consumer testing. Uh, we do think that there is a significant opportunity to make all the language even easier to understand, uh, to take it down several grade levels, as you actually said. Um, you know, and we definitely plan to do that, uh, for sure. Uh, I mean, we put the initial site up in 90 days, um, and then, you know, put this up, you know, you know, um, uh, very shortly thereafter. <laughs> and they're actually, um, on top of the uh, 4,400 uh, plus different insurance plans, um, you know, there's every Medicaid program, every CHIP program, every pre and condition insurance program plus 500 plus pages of content um, on how to navigate the insurance marketplace, the Affordable Care Act. So um, it's, it's a lot of text to work through, uh, you know, but uh, I think we've tried in general to make it uh, as English language as possible, uh, but we definitely think there's an opportunity to make it even more accessible, and so we'll keep doing that. Actually, one of the really cool things, which I, I won't point out because we don't have time, but on virtually every page in the site, there's a little yellow bubble that says, was this page helpful to you, yes or no? Um, and then comments, a comment section to say specifically, uh, uh, you know, um, your suggestion. We've gotten over 40,000 uh, comments since the launch of the site. Uh, and what Vex says, look, this is your site, not our site, so tell us what you want with it. Um, and a lot of it has had to do with what, what the hell is a donut hole? <laughs> uh, can you explain that to me? Interestingly, and this is actually contrary to what you might expect, the overwhelming gestalt of the comments is more detail. They said, do not dumb it down for me. Do not condescend to me. Do not try to oversimplify. Tell me the detail. Tell me more. Now, tell it to me in a way that doesn't say things like donut hole, <laughs> right? But let, it, let me have the information, right? Trust me, uh, which I think is actually very interesting. So we've actually deepened the content in a lot of cases and, again, tried to avoid jargon as much as we can. But I thought that was actually really, really interesting, right? Uh, and with respect to your second question, in no way, shape, or form will this replace the exchanges. <laughs> so uh, one particular point I should make is that the Secretary has been incredibly clear by the fact that she does not want this site to ever sell you anything, right? So it's meant to be an information utility. You'll never be able to buy your policies on the site. You'll never be able to enroll in anything on the site. You'll basically you know, find a plan that you like or find a program you like and then connect off this site to another site uh, or to a phone number to enroll or to buy it. Right? But this is meant to be really consumer reports. Um, it will, though, intertwine with these changes. Uh, they'll be set up to be places where you can actually buy insurance. Um, and that is actually, as, as I mentioned earlier, something we're trying to uh, work through the choreography of right now. Uh, but needless to say, the experience that we are uh, uh, gaining uh, with how to present information to consumers and how to structure this data uh, will be invaluable uh, to, to not just the future of healthcare.gov, but, but to the exchanges as well. So I apologize for talking so rapidly, but we had such a short period of time, and there was so much interesting conversation that I just felt the need to kind of go rapidly. But I figured this crowd, you know, goes that way too. <laughs> Todd, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I'll hang out here as long as you want. So I'll just sit right here and keep talking to people as long as they want to chat with me. So 